Hello, I hope you're doing well. This is Thursday's lecture. As you know, I'll be in Vietnam, and on this day when you are scheduled to view this, I will be uh, touring meat markets in Ho Chi Minh City and getting ready to go out to production systems. But I wanna to talk today about lipids and lipid oxidation. And this is a, a subject very dear to Dr. Smith's heart, and you can take a class just on lipids and understanding lipids, and that is his life, and has been his life, and very important. So this is just a basic, uh, uh, you know, baseline understanding of lipids and lipid oxidation. So our objectives for this lecture are to understand structure of the lipids, first of all, and understand chemical reactions involved in lipid oxidation, and then mechanisms involved in anti other than my microbial growth, obviously, is a very important aspect of industry and meat and meat shelf life. And frozen meat shelf life is limited by lipid oxidation, not microbial growth. And with the advent of further process ready to eat meat, lipid oxidation is as important as microbial growth and shelf life because it's a, involved in deterioration of flavor. So we're gonna talk about lipids first and their structure before we talk about oxidation and antioxidants. Lipids are important. They've gotten a really bad reputation since the 1990s, but they are sources of energy for the cell. They're also involved in cell membrane structure and function. We've talked a lot about that with the sarcolemma and also the sarcoplasmic reticulum, that, that lipid bilayer, uh, uh, very, very important. And they're also involved in metabolic function, such as precursors for hormones and vitamins. So the lipids play a very important biological function. They're also very important in brain development. Uh, so if you look at a body, you look at a mammalian uh, animal body, it contains several classes of lipids. It has neutral lipids or fatty acids and glycerides. And uh, there are some other types of lipids. But in meat, we really deal with the neutral lipids because we're, uh, we're not going to deal with the hormones and those type of things. So here are some classifications of lipids. Simple lipids that are fats and waxes, we're not going to talk about those. There are also compound lipids, such as phospholipids. Uh, cerebral sides and other compounds and, and derived lipids. But in meat, 99% of the lipids that are composed in meat are neutral lipids. And the main and, and the structure that we find uh, lipids in meat are triacylglycerol. Triacylglycerol, I gave you, this is the picture in the textbook. This is a picture that I found in another resource, but it's made up of a glycerol backbone, which is th three carbons that um, have, each has an oxygen and a carboxyl group right here, right? That's a carboxyl group. And attached to that are fatty acids. Fatty acids are long chain carbon compounds. And I always think about the triacylglyceride like a fork. So this is the base of the fork, and then it has three tongues sitting out here. And uh, this carbon backbone, uh, some, this is showing the sig uh, how we sometimes label it as SN1, SN2, and SN3, can have different fatty acids bound to it, depending on uh, lots of things like diet, metabolism, things like that. So this triacylglyceride is our component. About 1% of the lipids found in meat are phospholipids. And phospholipids, oh, well, I'll show you some phospholipids here in a second. Uh, these are the main fatty acids that we find in meat, whether that's in the adipose tissue or in the meat itself, in adipose tissue that we see as marbling. Uh, they are long chain carbon. We have uh, we classify them by the number of carbons and the number of double bonds and where the double bonds are located. 
the two fatty acids that have no double bond are palmitic and stearic. Palmitic acid has 16 carbons, you can count them, and a fatty acid always has the carboxyl group here, and then uh, just the, the carbon on this end. And you can see that, pretty simple, right? And this is a, a drawing of palmitic acid. It's called a saturated fatty acid because it's saturated with hydrogen. It's a naturally occurring. Palmitic acid makes up about 23% of the fatty acids in beef. The one that is associated with, with negative uh, health and with, with development of plaques and coronary heart disease is palmitic. Steric is similar in the fact that it has no double bonds and it has two more carbons in its chain. So it's defined as 18O. And steric acid is a saturated fatty acid as well. And notice that what we do is we put the, you can either call it by its common name or you can signify it by putting the number of carbons colon and then the number of double bonds. And down here we'll have number of double bonds and in parentheses is the carbon where that double bond is located. And that should be the carbon from the carboxyl end. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yep, it is. I have to make sure I remember that correctly. We do have fatty acids that have one double bond. Those are called monounsaturated fatty acids. We have two per prevalent fatty acids, monounsaturated fatty acids in meat. Uh, that is palmitoleic and oleic. Palmitoleic has 16 carbons and one double bond. And from the carboxyl, it should be nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yep, there it is. And then oleic has 18 carbons and one double bond, 18, one. And here's Oleg, and you can count, there's nine oh, from the carboxyl end, those are double bonds. And you'll see the double bond here, and then you see that there are 18 carbons. And notice that when you go from a, a saturated to a monounsaturated, where you have the double bond, as you know, that's that double bond uh, you're going to only have uh, one hydrogen on that, and that double bond's easier to break, right? It requires less energy to break a double bond than, than a covalent bond between carbons. And it also provides a bend in the structure. That's part of the reason I put those up there, so you can see the bend. So then we can also have polyunsaturated fatty acids. And those are fatty acids that have two or more double bonds. Uh, our most common uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids are linoleic, linolenic, and arachidonic. Linoleic has 18 carbons and two double bonds. And you notice that this is at nine and 12. So here's linoleic acid. There's the double bonds, nine and 12. And where you have the double bonds, you have a bend in the structure. So it looks different than oleic because of that extra double bond gives it another bend. We have a bend here and then a bend there. And linolenic, one extra letter N, has three double bonds at the nine the 12 and 13, 14, and 15. I should be able to know that. 9, 12, and 15 carbons. Now there can be double bonds at different carbons, and there can, uh, which will affect um, some of the nomenclature. These are the most common, and these are the fatty acids that are there at the highest percentage. Uh, and then arachidonic has four double bonds. But notice that the first double bond is at the fifth carbon, 8, 11, 14. 
So they're at different locations. And arachidonics there at as 20 carbons, it's there at fairly small amounts, but it's present. So we really have those three classes of lipids, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, monounsaturated has one double bond, polyunsaturated has two or more, and here we have linoleic and linolenic and arachidonic, and we can't have proxylines, we're not gonna talk about those. And then we have saturated fatty acids. The other 1% of the lipids that are present in meat are phospholipids, and those are the ones that make up the lipid bilayer. And I put different pictures, because as you know, I love pictures. Uh, and this shows, this is how we have many times draw the uh, fatty, uh, phospholipids, you see that drawn in lipid uh, and membrane structure all the time. We have a hydrophobic tail and a hydrophilic head. Hydrophilic means it's, it's attracted to water, hydrophobic, it's afraid of it. So that's why the heads always stick out and the tails stick in on a membrane. And we still have a glycerol backbone in phospholipids, but notice that at the third carbon, we have this phosphate group and head that's attached, and then we have two fatty acids to the other carbon. And there tends to be, uh, while any fatty acid can be bound here that we've talked about, tend to be a higher proportion of polyunsaturated fatty acids in the phos in, uh, phospholipids, which means that that's why we always have these little bends. They're not straight. If they were totally straight, that would be a saturated fatty acid, right? So here, this is an, a picture. Here's the glycerol backbone, the phosphate group, and then there are two fatty acids bound to the glycerol backbone. And this is just a, another drawing of the same thing to help you to see that. So we're very interested in lipids uh, at, because they are a component of meat. They're an important component. They're an important important biological component, but they also contribute to lipid oxidation. And this is, lipid oxidation is the main cause of deterioration in quality of meat and meat products that affects flavor and color, texture, and nutritive value. And one of the most common things, it's ironic that you will be listening to this lecture right before uh, Thanksgiving, but when your turkey has sat for two days after Thanksgiving and you eat it, and it has that off flavor, that is due to lipid oxidation. We many times, some people refer to that as warmed over flavor or rancidity is another name for that. And um, since we've moved more towards free cooked meat, uh, lipid oxidation has become a more important uh, chemical reaction so that is uh, what happens is we get oxidative, it's really officially called oxidative rancidity or lipid oxidation and results in unpleasant odors and taste in the fat. And it can be detected within 48 hours in cooked meat. And once it starts, it's kind of a domino effect. We can have it in raw meat. And when we cook meat, it in uh, cooking itself causes heat lipid denaturation, which is a component of lipid oxidation. And we see uh, cooked meat and raw meat, cooked meat will always have a higher level of lipid oxidation. Uh, and the fatty acids in meat are related to lipid oxidation because the higher percentage of mono and polyunsaturated fatty acids, especially polyunsaturated fatty acids, they are more susceptible to lipid oxidation because wherever you have a double bond, there's a greater opportunity to break that bond than when we just have single covalent bonds. So it's at the double bond site in fatty acids, whether they're on the phospholipid group or on the triacylglyceride, where we see lipid oxidation occur. Uh, and so triacylglycerides and phospholipids are both contributors because phospholipids tend to have a higher percentage of polyunsaturated fatty acids attached to their glycerol backbone, they tend to be 
That's really where uh, most scientists will agree that lipid oxidation starts. And that membrane bound uh, uh, phospholipid. So what happens? And I'm, there's, we could spend a whole, almost a whole semester talking about lipid oxidation. But basically what happens, we have a double bond in a fatty acid and there's oxygen. Oxygen actually need, can be in the singlet or the triplet state. We're not gonna go there from a chemistry standpoint, uh, but it needs to be in, uh, I think it's in the singlet state and it then can attack the double bond and form a peroxide linkage. So hydrogen peroxide is one of the first components that we find in lipid oxidation. Uh, and in meat, this reaction occurs so rapidly that we cannot reliably measure peroxides. But in lipids, pure lipids and oils, like with, in frying, they use peroxide values as a measurement of the quality of the, the fat. Uh, in meat, we have too many other precursors and the reaction goes too rapidly. Uh, and we know that phospholipids in beef are 15% more unsaturated than triacylglycerides. So the phospholipids, especially when we uh, break the membrane from either just time, from cooking, from heating and causing it to melt, or from cutting, grinding, anything that's gonna break that membrane, uh, accelerates lipid oxidation. What's also interesting is that species of meat that uh, have a higher uh, sat unsaturation level in their phospholipids tend to have oxidation or lipid oxidation occur more rapidly. So chicken, uh, white meat, is six, its phospholipid fraction is 16 to 22% higher in unsaturated fatty acids versus white meat. So it's the dark meat that will, will uh, develop rancidity more rapidly than white meat. So once this, the oxygen attacks the double bond and you form a peroxide linkage, the reaction, that's the domino effect. It's like pushing the first domino over because there are catalysts to this reaction. Lead or copper catalyze rancidity. Both of those, uh, uh, of those uh, elements there have the ability to have two valence states, right? F, just like iron with Fe plus two and Fe plus three. And so notice that that is due to an electron, right? You're losing an electron and it oxidizes. Um, and also free, uh, Non -heme, we'll call it non-heme iron. You'll see that in the literature a lot. That's basically free iron that's not bound up in the heme. Uh, also, hemoglobin, myoglobin, and cytochromes contribute, can contribute to helping to catalyze the reaction. And, um, but we do know that in meat, having these uh, ions that, or these uh, elements that can oxidize really speeds this reaction up. So we usually talk about lipid oxidation in two in three steps. Uh, initiation, propagation, and termination. Initiation is where the oxygen attacks the double bond of the uh, poly or monounsaturated fatty acid and forms a free radical. So, and the peroxide is then formed. And when we have a free radical, that is a binding site that's very, very reactive. And that free radical then reacts with other double bonds and we get a free radical chain reaction, which we call propagation. And eventually, as those free radicals are formed, they will form a non-radical product and a stable product. Uh, a lot of free radicals are produced during peroxide formation. Uh, Hydroperoxides are the major initial reaction products of fatty acids with oxygen. And uh, hydroperoxides are very reactive, as you know. And so we can control this reaction, the rate of this reaction, either by preventing oxygen from attacking 
fatty acid double bond. Or once they form hydroperoxides, we can add compounds that are going to preferentially bind to those free radicals or the hydrogen or the peroxide rather. I want you to know the three steps of, of auto oxidation or lipid oxidation. This is from your textbook. And here's initiation a fatty acid and its oxygen is going to attack and form a free radical. A dot there means it's a free radical. And that free, so that free radical reacts with oxygen and forms uh, dimer, polymers, cyclic peroxides hydroperoxide compounds that are very reactive, that those compounds can come down here and bind with another RH. Oh, wow, that was kind of cute, wasn't it? <laughs> now you can really see it. <laughs> with that RH, which is part of the fatty acid, right? This is a fatty acid chain with a hydrogen at the double bond, and then form an ROOH. These are uh, acrylic and cyclic compounds. Uh, these are these are considered ter uh, can be uh, part of terminal uh, compounds. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, or we can lose the OH and form another radical, which can then go and form an ROOR, ROR dimers. We can have cleavage. The first time I learned about lipid oxidation, a very wonderful man by the name of Dr. David Kramer, who was a lipid biochemist, drew on the board at four in the afternoon every possible reaction. I will not do that to you. And you may think she's staying too simple. And I am a little bit, because it's a lot more complicated than this. I mean, it, it's pretty complicated. The key thing is that we form aldehydes, ketones, hydrocarbons, furans, acids, cyclic compounds, uh, some dimers. We finally get down here where we form terminal products that are not the same. And this is a, there are so many different compounds that can be formed during this reaction. The key is we start out with oxygen attacking that double bond, that RH, forming peroxide, which is then uh, very reactive, right here. And then um, it can react with other uh, double bonds, or it can go over here and through cleavage form aldehydes and ketones. But basically, once we start this reaction, we form new products that are very reactive and propagation can proceed. And then propagation forms all these free radicals, which eventually form, uh, bind with other free radicals to form uh, very stable products. But those products are breakdown products, and they don't have the same uh, flavor. So I'm going to, um, yeah, oxygen has to be in the singlet state. Uh, each initiation process produces two free radicals. So once we started, boy, we have let the cat out of the bag. One thing I do want to point out is that the energy required for radical production by rupture of a CH bond is about 80 kilocalories. Uh, so there has to be energy from some place. Heat, cooking, provides great energy. Light can provide energy. Temperature fluctuations can provide energy. Obviously, cooking provides the most, the highest amount of energy to really start this reaction. But that's to give you an idea that we do have to have something um, to start the reaction, to get the initial rupture. And then it takes less energy for addition of oxygen to form diuraticals at the double bond. Propagation, uh, this is where we have either an R with a, um, a, a, a free radical, ROO with a free radical, um, can form with other free radicals or with other RH groups at the double bond. Uh, 
we form lots of different peroxide radicals, hydroperoxides and new hydrocarbons. And those new radicals form, they contribute to the chain by reacting with other molecules. That's why it's, it's the way I felt about the puppies. One got out the door, then I was rushed. And I'm like, initiation was the first puppy. Propagation was all the puppies, okay? And then finally, here comes mom and the all nurse and I have termination. I just thought so. So termination is where the end products do not have a, a free radical and they're stable products. I'm not gonna ask you to draw these reactions. How do we control lipid oxidation? First of all, we do things like vacuum packaging. Remove the oxygen. Remove those things that start initiation. That really slows down oxidation. Another thing we can do is not put meat in light because light's gonna provide some energy to start lipid oxidation. We can uh, also make sure that temp we don't have temperature fluctuations. Even temperature fluctuations from 34 to 40 and back down and up and down like that, they may seem like minor temperature fluctuations, but we're gonna see not only uh, increased microbial growth, but we'll also see uh, lipid oxidation initiated at a greater rate. Microorganisms uh, interact and can, and can help uh, start initiation as well. So there are lots of things that can be, so we can, or we can add compounds, chemicals that control or retard war, uh, warmed over flavor development or oxidative reactions. Uh, the two main actions of, of, of antioxidants are the some antioxidants interrupt the free radical chain mechanism. So when they're in that first step, when we form a peroxide, they will preferentially bind to the free radical and stop it. Uh, and then they can also function as being preferentially oxidized instead of allowing the free fat, the, uh, the unsaturated fatty acid double bond to be oxidized and to be attacked. That's not as good. And there's actually a third mechanism, which is on the next slide, which is a metal chelator, one that ties up catalysts for this reaction. And uh, th that would be something that ties up uh, iron uh, and, and some of the other ones. So metal chelators, they can slow down the reaction. We talk about uh, compounds that, in the previous slide, that can be, uh, let me go back here, that can interrupt the free radical chain mechanism. Those are called free oxygen scavengers. And uh, they work after initiation to limit propagation. Almost all of those are phenolic compounds. And if you remember, a phenolic ring has two states where it, it moves back and forth, right? Two valent states and, and the double bonds move uh, from one to the other. Uh, there's also, if you use um, free radical, free oxygen scavengers in combination of metal chelators, you can get some synergistic effects depending on the antioxidant. And that's a strategy a lot of people use. Here's some common antioxidants. Uh, this is, DHA, this is BHT. Those are the most common antioxidants used in the food industry. Used at 0.01% is what they're legally uh, restricted to, and they work. They limit oxidation. Here's the phenolic ring, and so what happens if you have a free radical, it's gonna go in and stabilize this, this phenolic ring. Here are some other compounds with phenolic rings. I work with some Natural compounds uh, like uh, anthocyanins and tannins, and all those compounds have uh, phenolic rings, and that's basically how they work. So what happens with an antioxidant is when you have a free radical, 
whether that free radical is an R, an RO, or an ROO, the um, free radical will donate the hydrogen and then the antioxidant without, with the free radical is, is not as reactive. So it's going to uh, help to stabilize that. Uh, if you have then these free radicals on the uh, antioxidant, they combine to form stable products. So that's the series of reactions. What I really want you to know is about the metal chelators and the free oxygen uh, scavengers and how they work and, and what are some common things. There are other, other compounds that have some antioxidant properties. Nitrites actually have some uh, antioxidant properties because they help to chelate iron. Uh, some other chelating agents, phosphates have some antioxidant properties because they chelate heavy metals. Uh, EDTA, we add, it's a, it's a pretty powerful uh, antioxidant, but we are not allowed to add it to meat. We do in the chemistry lab when we're running uh, T-bars to stop the reaction. Citric acid, which is less effective than EDTA uh, or phosphates, uh, also helps to chelate some uh, metal, heavy metal ions. Uh, ascorbate, which is also used in cure meat, uh, used at a moderate level, not a really high level. Used at a high level, it actually can um, it can actually induce lipid oxidation. But used at lower levels, it's thought to um, shift the balance between ferrous and ferric iron, uh, and also has some activity as an oxygen scavenger. Uh, so the synthetic phenolic antioxidants, BHA and DHT, uh, which we've already shown, I've already shown you the structure. Uh, they are, uh, they interrupt a free radical chain mechanism by that phenolic link. So that's pretty much what, how uh, antioxidants work. I talked about some natural antioxidants. Flavonoids are also uh, natural antioxidants because they have a phenolic ring. Rosemary is one of the most common natural antioxidants used because the carnosol and rosanol and rosmariquinone and rosmaradiphenol, I got that one out, um, all those have phenolic rings and they stabilize that free radical train, train reaction. And then on tannins we have hydrolyzed and condensed and we find those in uh, high and dark fruits like blueberries, dark colored uh, vegetables as well. Uh, we work with high tannin sorghums and we found that the high tannin sorghum brand where the tannins are, are good natural antioxidants. Uh, and the Maillard reaction, which we're going to talk about, about flavor, uh, also uh, some of those uh, derivative compounds can stabilize free radical chain reaction. And when we smoke meats, we produce phenols from the smoke, and those phenols act like very similar to BHA and BHT. So, I hope you know a little bit more about lipids now. We've talked about the structure of lipids and the chemical reactions involved in lipid oxidation and their mechanisms involved with antioxidants. And I can tell you that all of you, if you work in the food industry in any way, you're gonna deal with this reaction. I know I went through this a little bit rapidly. Hopefully you'll have a chance to review this. And the biggest thing is to get the structure components of lipids and then understand those basic three reactions involved in lipid oxidation and then how we control it. Uh, please bring your questions for these last three lectures to class uh, a week, the, the week, the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. Remember your papers are due at that time. I've asked most of you to give me kind of what you think of your final draft on Monday. I've kind of left that open. I have some of you I'm meeting with, but I want to use that time to help you finish up your papers. Thank you very much for your patience. I hope you've had a good week, and I look forward to telling you about my trip to Vietnam and what I find in the meat markets and the beef production systems there. Thank you very much.